Uh, God is not unfaithful to forget your work of faith and labor of love. And more than that, it is something that we must believe. We must believe that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so thank you for your diligence. Uh, God is here. The angels are here. The spirits of just men made perfect are here and you are here. And uh, I believe that God has a blessing for you. It is really comforting to me to speak to such a knowledgeable group of people because I realize that I don't have to get every scripture exactly right because the word of God is having free course in your life. The text is Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the power of God. Uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is revealed the righteousness of God from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's verse 17. Uh, this was dictated by Paul to a man named Tertius around AD 58. I think Tertius, Silas, and Silvanus were all the same guy. Silas is the Hebrew word for third Tertius is the Latin word for third. And so Paul gets to Corinth and he hears that Phoebe's on her way uh, to Rome. And he says, Tertius, I got to I gotta send a letter. I wanted to go to Rome. I want to go to Spain and I have never been able to get there. And so I got to send him a letter. And I, one of the things I want to tell him, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed. Now, that letter was dictated around AD 58. And at about the same time, just shortly before that, he had written 1st and 2nd Corinthians just a few months before he dictated this letter to Rome. I've been fascinated by power for a long time. I remember as a small young man, I got a Cushman motor scooter. And I still remember when I had a bicycle going up Easton Street, was I'd been at ball practice. Man, I was so tired. And as I pedaled, I, I didn't even pedal up Easton Street. I just put my glove on the handlebars and I trudged. I pushed my bicycle up until I got that motor scooter. Oh, man. You could go up the hill just as easy as you could go down the hill. There's power. I... I, I loved it. And I think Adam, after he's kicked out of Eden and he had to earn his living by the sweat of his face, what a relief it was when he was able to harness an ox. Oh, man, you could plow so much more and it's so much easier than it was doing it by yourself. I suppose when somebody trained an elephant, they thought, man, this is the ultimate in power. Maybe you've heard the joke about the lion who claimed to be the king of the jungle and he was bragging about it to all of the animals. You know, he'd ask the monkey, the zebra, the antelope, who's the king of the jungle? You are, oh mighty lion. You know, so come to the elephant. Who's the king of the jungle? The elephant reached down and grabbed that lion and slammed him on the ground six or eight times and threw him in a mud puddle. Lion wiped the mud out of his eyes and said, Hey, just because you don't know the right answer, you don't have to be so huffy about it. <laughs> well, we know the right answer. Uh, the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Now, man uh, harnessed other kinds of power. I got to go to Brazil some time ago. Did you realize that the mouth of the Amazon River is 150 miles wide. That's like from here to Kansas City. Most powerful river in the world. The Nile's the longest, the Amazon's, can you imagine harnessing that power? The electrical generator, man, uh, over in Kansas, there's a big shovel called Big Brutus. 16 stories tall. And the bucket on that shovel holds 90 cubic yards of material. That's enough to fill three railroad cars, one dip. That's 
power. And it's electrical power. That machine, 11 million pounds run by electricity. When they came across atomic power, Albert Einstein said there's enough atomic energy in a paper clip for 18 kilotons of TNT. But when Mount St. Helens blew, it was 20,000 times as powerful as the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. God is the ultimate power. That's why Paul wrote to the Ephesians. I want you to know about the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him on his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named. And I want you to know about that power. But after we talk about that power, you may not be quite as excited to have it. Let's begin with Paul in Philippi where he was shamefully treated. They stripped him naked in public and beat him, put him in the inner prison. He left town, went down to Thessalonica, only lasted three Sabbath days. They drove him out of town. And when he wrote back, he said, you know, the gospel didn't come to you just in word, but in power. Well, then how come you were driven out of town? Got down to Berea, and the Jews came, chased him out of town, and he was pretty discouraged. You know, Jesus went into Gethsemane and said to Peter, James, and John, tarry you here and watch with me. My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. So Paul sent word to Silas and Timothy, do thou diligence to come unto me with all speed. I need you. And when he came to Corinth, he said, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Well, if the Spirit is so powerful, what are you on the run for? How come you're there in weakness and fear and much trembling? Chapter 4, Paul said, Apostles, you know, in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul talked about, I worked the signs of an apostle in your midst. The apostles had some, you know, can you imagine what it would be like to have people want to have your shadow come across them so they'd get healed? That's a little beyond where I am. <laughs> Or when somebody lies to you that they drop dead? Oh boy, what would that do for church attendance? It's kind of... <laughs> or Paul saying to Sergius Paulus, you know, you're going to be blind. That helped me to see when God took away my eyes. And that's going to happen to you, buddy. You're not going to be able to see anything. Or can you imagine having handkerchiefs and aprons, you just touch them babies and they got healing power. And yet Paul said, you know, where we apostles are in line, we're last. Like men condemned to death. Now you and I cannot relate to a Roman parade, but we can relate to being chosen up on teams when we were in school. And it was the best looking and the best athletes and the most popular that got chosen. And we'd say, hey, <laughs> notice me, you know. And if you were last to be chosen, it kind of creates a certain emotion. Why doesn't anybody want me? How come I am the last to be chosen? 
And so Paul said, you know, we're like men condemned to death. And then he said, we're fools. You're wise. You're honored. We're dishonored. Even to this present hour, we're hungry, thirsty, in rags, homeless. And when they cuss us out, we bless them. And that's the guy that wrote to Rome, I'm not ashamed of this message. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God and salvation. In chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, Paul said, Be imitators of me, even as I am also of Christ. Well, that gives us kind of an insight because when Isaiah predicted the coming of Christ, he said, You ain't going to believe this. <laughs> who hath believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. He's going to come up like a tender shoot and root out of dry ground, despised and rejected a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Can you imagine going to the county fair? Hey, everybody, come around, pay your money. We're going to show you power. And you get in there and there's a tender shoot. He said, give me my money back. And yet, that was Paul. Like a tender shoot. He said in his second Corinthian letter, he said, man, we despaired of life. You know, he'd been chased out of Ephesus. And... Uh, he was so concerned about the Corinthians when he got to Troas and a great door and effectual was opened, he said, I couldn't stay there. He said, oh man, I wanted to, but I was so concerned about you. And he gets over to Philippi and I think that's where Titus came. And then he sent this second letter and he was talking about, uh, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We're hard pressed. On every side, we're not crushed, we're perplexed, not despair, we're persecuted, we're not for say, cast down, not destroyed, and we don't look at the things we see as too depressing. Can you relate to that? Anybody in a mess right now? Family problems, health problems, uh, financial problems, political problems. <laughs> oh man, I don't look at the things I see too depressed. I look at the things that I don't see because the things I see are only temporal. Amen. You know, the devil specializes in temporary things. All these kingdoms I'll give you if you just bow down and worship me. Where are those kingdoms today? <laughs> They're gone. Uh, ain't, ain't you glad that Jesus didn't cash in for something temporal? Aren't you glad that the kingdom of God is an eternal kingdom that will never pass away? Amen. One of the things about Paul and also about Jesus was he knew who he was. It's interesting when Jesus came into the upper room, all these guys were arguing about who was going to be the greatest. Everybody knew that no but he had washed their feet. Everybody saw the basin, everybody saw the towel, but nobody was humble enough to wash anybody's feet. That was the job for a servant, not for me. I'm better than that. But Jesus knew who he was, where he came from, and where he's going. Now, if you know who you are, where you come, you know, <laughs> you can wash feet. Amen. And when they throw you in jail... You can say, Silas, let's sing. We, we got that jailer right where we want him. <laughs> when you're in Gethsemane and Peter pulls out the machara, little old sword about 18 inches long, and Jesus knew who he was. Peter, give me a break. There's a whole legion of soldiers here, and you're going to do it with that? So don't you know I got 12 legions of angels? And if I snapped my finger, they'd come here. One angel killed 185,000 soldiers in a single life. Can you imagine what 12 legions of angels? Peter, get a life, you know. Come on. Amen. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, well, 11, Paul, you know, of the Jews five times received. He had kind of a rough life. 
But when he was baptized, Ananias showed him all the things he'd have to suffer. Now, we're talking about the power of the gospel, and Paul writing Rome, you want this power or not? <laughs> he said, tell them that <laughs> we can rejoice in our tribulation. Because we know that tribulation produces patience, patience, experience, experience, hope, hope makes us not. Tell them that. Tell them everything's working together for good. And Paul writes this or dictates this letter out of the crucible of suffering where he said, I despaired even of life. One of the neat things about weakness is it takes away your pride. Now, if you got any pride, why don't you go to the hospital for a few days <laughs> and that'll cure you probably. Well, Paul said, you know, they were given to me so many revelations. And I was so proud, you know, they thought I was a god. They thought I was the Greek god Mercury. And then I got this thorn in the flesh. I think it was the result of a stoning he had at Lystra where they smashed his face so that he was rude in speech. Aiken hot right. He said, God, take this away. Tried three times. I no. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Amen. Now, one of the reasons I quoted from the 17th verse as well is that it sets the stage for where you and I are right now, I think. The gospel is the power of God and the salvation to everyone, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For therein is revealed the righteousness of God from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Well, you probably know that that is a quotation from the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2 and verse 4. The book of Habakkuk is a little bitty book. Habakkuk's name is only found two times in the Bible in the first and the third chapters of that little book. And the first chapter talks about the Babylonians chastening and destroying Judah. And the, Jew, uh, the people of Judah didn't believe that was going to happen. They said, hey, we're the people of God. Uh, we're the chosen ones of God. It ain't going to happen to us. And Habakkuk said, oh, yeah, it is. And Paul quoted that when he was at Antioch of Pisidia. These proud Jews, you know, they said, we can do what we want to with this message. They said, oh, no, you can't. <laughs> Behold, you despisers and wondering prayers, God's going to work a work in your day, a work that you will in no wise believe, though a man declared it unto you. And that's what's going to happen to Judah. Judah was going to be destroyed like evening wolves destroy helpless lambs. It was going to be like an eagle or a vulture swooping down on a rabbit. That's not a pretty sight to see. And so Habakkuk says, God, why are you going to, why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? The Babylonians are cruel people. Their God is their strength. And we love you. And we No, God said, no. Don't you despise the chastening of the Lord. But now... Don't forget that I am in charge of nations as well as individuals. Remember what I said to Abram, your descendants are going to be enslaved for 400 years, but the nation that enslaves them, I will punish. Amen. You believe that or not? If you, I think Amram and Jochebed believed that. I think they knew if 400 years had gone by and they were enslaved, and I think, they said, hey, this is a goodly child. We're not afraid of the king's commandments. And by faith, they hid Mo I think they trained him. You're going to be the one. And he thought he was going to do it with his own power, and he killed that Egyptian, and instead of creating a revolution, he became a fugitive. And 40 years later, when he was nothing, that's when God's power kicked in. <laughs> and it's neat to believe it. Uh, sometimes when God wants to do something powerful, he reduces us to nothing. And so God said, you know, chapter 2, 
of Habakkuk. He said, write this down. Make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. Some people say, well, it's so big you can read it and run at the same time. But it's an important message. And it was about God's judgment upon Babylon. Now, for the everlasting, for, for the revelation awaits an appointed time and it speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it, it will certainly come and will not delay. Now, this is an essential ingredient to our faith. We got to believe Amen. for the future. Hebrew people receive the gospel, good news. Hey, you're going to inherit the land of Canaan, and one of you will chase a hundred, five of you will put 10,000 to flight. The hornets are going to drive them out. Didn't do them one bit of good. Why not? They didn't mix it with faith. That's Hebrews 4 2. They didn't believe it. That's why their bones are in the wilderness. They didn't believe it. I don't know. This is, you know, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. We start believing that God has forgiven our sin. That's a good place to start. <laughs> John the Baptist never worked a miracle. Greatest prophet ever born of a woman, and yet whoever's least in the kingdom is greater than John. If you miss this, you're missing a whole bunch. Wrap your mind around Luke chapter 16 where there's a beggar who doesn't have a friend, dogs licking his wounds, lying in his own filth, and the rich guy who was clothed in purple had plenty of everything. Who are you ashamed of? <laughs> now, if you looking on that story as God looks on that story, <laughs> Lazarus is going to be comforted by the angels and the rich man's going to be tormented. Now, you got to see that to understand the essence of the God. Jesus said, my kingdom's not of this world. Are you a king? Of course I'm a king. That's why I came into the world. But it's not of this world. You got to, and you can't see it till you're born again. Nicodemus, you got to be born again to see what I'm talking about. It's just, a little beyond human vision. You can't see that without divine help. So we get down to verse 4. See, he's puffed up. King of Babylon, old Belshazzar, man, that guy was so cocky and proud. His military leaders said, the Medes and the Persians are right outside the gates. Ah, we got walls 300 feet high. Let's have a party. We don't have to worry about those guys. Tell you what I'm going to do to just show you who I am. I'm going to get the sacred vessels that came out of the temple and we're going to drink and honor the gods of gold and silver and wood and stone. <laughs> and that's when... A sleeveless hand wrote, many, many, tackle you farsen on the wall. And Daniel came in and said, Belshazzar, you shouldn't have been so proud. Yeah. Do you remember what happened to your daddy, Nebuchadnezzar? God made an animal out of him. He ate grass like an ox for seven years. You knew that. You knew it. And yet didn't do one thing about it. And so tonight, you're going to die. Tonight. You're not going to have to wait three years for the Medes and the Persians to beat down the walls. Isaiah had prophesied a couple of hundred years before. Yes. Isaiah chapter 45, I will open before him the two leave gates and they shall not be shut. And that night, the drunken guards left the gates open and the army of the Medes and the Persians came in through the open gates to the palace and killed Belshazzar on that very night. But you're not like that. The just shall live by faith. We don't look at what we see. It's too discouraging. We walk by faith and not by sight. And so if you've got family problems, financial problems, physical, I got these things, you know, we look beyond that. Amen. We look to eternal Amen. things. Kind of like the servant of Elisha, Lord, 
There's a bunch of these enemies and they're circling and I see the sun reflecting off of their spears. Ah, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Don't worry about it. I don't know where you are in your spiritual journey, but I can relate to Paul saying, hey, I, Timothy and Silas, come, I need you. I can relate to Jesus saying to Peter, James, and John, I need you. One of the most powerful songs ever composed was composed by Thomas A. Dorsey. He wrote over a thousand gospel songs. Tommy Dorsey, there was a white guy, a trombone player. This is a black man. Thomas A. Dorsey, the father of gospel music, wrote a thousand gospels to him. One of them was Peace in the Valley. But this song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, been translated into 32 different languages. So powerful. Oh, man, what a powerful song. It was composed in 1932. Thomas A. Dorsey lived in the south side of Chicago. His wife, Nettie, was nine months pregnant with their first child. He kissed her goodbye, went down the stairs of his apartment building, got in a Model A Ford, August 1932, went to St. Louis to lead worship in a gospel meeting. Next day, he gets a telegram, your wife, Nettie, just died. Got in his Model A, drove back to Chicago, found his little baby boy died too. And he was like Paul on his way from Ephesus to Corinth. I despaired even of life. And in that valley, God gave him a song. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Let me stand. I'm tired. I'm weak. I'm worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord. Take my hand.